Let me make my meaning abundantly and completely clear if I can. The United States floors any war, cold or otherwise. Its only desire is to live in peace and freedom and to let all other peoples live in peace and freedom. In that spirit, we declare that so far as we are concerned, Africa shall never be the scene of any war, cold or hot. But we also declare that Africa for the Africans means Africa for the Africans, and not Africa as a hunting ground for alien ambitions. June 30th, 1960, independence comes to the Belgian Congo. King Baudouin himself flies to the capital city of Leopoldville to break the bonds that have linked his country and its African colony for 75 years. This is a day of rejoicing and misgiving. There are many observers who feel that the Congo and her people have not been properly prepared for independence, that the new nation is destined for crises, chaos, conflict. The Congo, in the heart of equatorial Africa, is three times larger than Texas. Along the banks of the Congo River, an ancient civilization is known to have flourished centuries ago. The Congo is not one land, but many lands. Its 150 major tribes speak 38 different dialects. In 1960, the Congo is only a few short decades removed from the Stone Age. Patrice Lumumba, age 34, a one-time postal clerk, is the first premier of the new nation. His rise and fall will be turbulent and tragic. Only 10 days after independence, calamity descends upon the Congo. Members of the Congolese army revolt. The Lumumba government cannot control them. And civilians, Congolese and Belgians alike, are attacked in violent rioting. A military strongman, Joseph Mobutu, emerges to seal the downfall of Patrice Lumumba, who is taken prisoner as he tries to flee Leopoldville. Lumumba later will disappear and then be found dead. With the infant Congo Republic in chaos, the mineral-rich province of Katanga proclaims its own independence. The premier of the secessionist province, Moïse Chambé, defies the central government and appeals for and receives Belgian support in establishing his own regime. Chambé vows civil war if necessary to protect his puppet government. And so Congolese go to war against Congolese. The fruits of independence are bitter. A national problem becomes an international crisis when the central Congolese government appeals to the United Nations for help. The Security Council authorizes the sending of a UN peacekeeping mission to the Congo. Within days, the troops reach the troubled land. Aerial transport is supplied by the United States and other major powers. The military volunteers are provided by a dozen neutralist nations. In time, the Chombe revolt is put down. Secession of Katanga rejoins the Congo Republic, and the defiant premier agrees to forego all revolutionary activity. The United Nations has achieved an uneasy truce in the smoldering powder keg. Then Red China's Zhou Enlai and Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella bring the Cold War into the Congo. They agree to supply and transport arms and material to communist Congolese rebels.
Communist Russia sends Anastas Mikoyan to Ghana to meet with Premier Nkrumah. Two men and their countries join in attacking the United Nations intervention in the Congo. Nkrumah announces his support of the Red Rebels, and Mikoyan reiterates Russia's refusal to pay her share of UN assessments for the peacekeeping mission. The Soviet action, the intervention by African nations such as Ghana, Egypt, Algeria on the rebel side, finally bankrupts the UN Congo operation. Without funds and financing, the International Peace Force leaves the Congo to its uncertain fate. In three years of independence, the nation has known neither peace nor freedom. Colonialism is ended, but conflict is not past. In a desperate attempt to unify the fragmented land, Luis Chambe is called back to become premier of all the Congo. Acting to halt Soviet attempts to sabotage the central government, the entire 100-man staff of the Russian embassy is ordered to leave Leopoldville in November 1963. But the departure of the Soviet officials does not end communist intrigue in the Congo. Red-made weapons and war material find their way to Congolese rebels with the help of sympathetic African nations. The build-up of rebel strength is reflected in hit-and-run raids on more and more government outposts. Missionaries, doctors, teachers are taken prisoners and held as hostages as the communist insurgents bargain for concessions from the Chombe government. 2,000 Europeans and Americans are caught up in the crossfire between the two sides. In November 1964, the United States and Belgium, with the consent and approval of the central government, undertake a mercy mission to rescue the hostages from the rebels. American transports fly Belgian paratroopers over the jungles to the city of Stanleyville, capital of Oriental Province. Aircraft after aircraft lands on the pockmarked runway, rolling into position to pick up the survivors saved by the paratroopers. The end of their ordeal is written in many different ways, in many different faces, the old and the young the wounded, and the well. More than 1,800 hostages are rescued. Many can walk, some must be carried aboard the waiting planes. The Mercy Armada shuttles back and forth from Stanleyville to Leopoldville, transporting the refugees to freedom and safety. lift continues for four days. Each new day, each new flight, bringing its own new story of terror and suffering from survivors who came only to serve and to minister to the Congolese people. Some will forget the agony of their nightmare in the Congo. Others will carry to their graves the scars on their lives. Those who watch will remember too. Last to leave the aircraft are the dead. More than 80 hostages have been massacred, among them two American missionaries. The tragic episode is but the latest chapter in the troubled history of a tormented land. And in death, the martyred missionaries have found the peace that the Congo still seeks. <laughs>